Welcome to the Coop Tank. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, coming to you from Sweet Recording in beautiful Mount Laurel, New Jersey. You know, I, I didn't come into the studio last week because it was snowing, and the week before, Joe was building a studio. It's one of the uh, great... One of the great things that Sweet Recording does, and to tell you more about this wonderful place, is my friend and the producer of this show, Joe Ganjami. Take it away, Joe. Hey, Coop. Thanks so much. Yeah, man, we had a blast building that studio for that client. Uh, so, yeah, at Sweet Recording, we help brands and businesses to leverage the power of podcasting to generate quality content, amplify their message, and expand their audience in a unique way. We can help you to get started. We provide everything from planning to publication. Um, we also offer mobile recording, live streaming, and yes, studio builds. So if you're interested in learning more, contact us anytime at hello at sweetrecording.com or visit us on the web at sweetrecording.com. Again, that's S-U-I-T-E. Take it away, Coop. All right, so we got a great show there, guys. I've met just through different, I met one through a chamber of commerce. I don't even know how I met my one guest, Ben. We'll get to that later. And Jeff, I've met through the JBN. And my first guest from Marigel, it's Jeff Brenner. How you doing, Jeff? Good morning. I'm good. Lovely to right. see you today. And from Robert Half, it's Ben York. How is it going, Ben? Good morning, Steve. Thanks for having me. And from Integrity Staffing, we have Ken Bodie. I got it right. How you doing, Ken? Doing great, Steve. Thanks for having me there. I really appreciate it. So, Jeff, uh, tell us a little, little about Marigold, what you guys do. Sure. Uh, Marigold is a licensed private detectives agency in New Jersey, uh, Cherry Hill. Uh, we conduct uh, a lot of corporate investigations, white collar crime, mostly computer fraud investigations, employees doing bad things and then checking out their computers and the systems. We also do a lot of background checks um, and uh, due diligence investigations for financial transactions, so checking everybody's background before you do the deal and buy something or lend money. That's our, that's our niche. Okay, great. Now, how about you? Uh, tell us a little about Robert Half, Ben. Sure. Um, so Robert Half's one of the uh, world's lar largest and oldest staffing firms uh, specializing in the professional services. Uh, so mainly accounting and finance, legal, um, marketing and HR. Uh, those are our are, are, uh, specializations in the labor market. Um, we place people in a variety of different ways. Uh, we can help clients with project-based staffing, full-time staffing. Um, we're industry agnostic as well. Um, and my specific territory is the Delaware Valley. So nice and local. Uh, but Robert Half reaches uh, all across the world. Uh, we have over 400 offices uh, across the world. So, Cool. And how about you, Ken? Tell us about integrity staffing, which is also staffing, but completely different. We, we are different um, in that we, we focus mainly on light industrial business, um, basic clerical business. We do some professional staffing, but, but nowhere near like Robert Half does. We, we've, logistics has always been our forte. Um, we currently have about 35 offices around the country, still privately owned. Um, we're about 30 years old. I've been with the business 20, 25 years. So pretty much since the very beginning. And, uh, and like I said, we, we basically help people in either temp, temp to hire or direct hire jobs, mainly in the logistics, productivity, and some clerical um, positions. So, you know, everyone, everyone has a story. Everyone does different things. We all, we all find out how we end up somewhere. You know, some people stay with the job their whole life some people don't some people jump around how did you end up jeff how did how did marigold come about how did you end up becoming where you your position you are now um so i'm one of the uh, lucky uh, members of the new jersey and pennsylvania bar uh, i got out um i was a uh, trial lawyer for 14 years and ultimately went in-house with a private detective agency that was my expert witness in a very large international fraud case. Um, we become friends with the owners of the detective agency as well as professionally. And at the end of the case, they, the two partners there asked me to join as in-house counsel uh, to run the U.S. investigations. It was an international uh, agency. So there, I was asked to run the U.S. office. And ultimately, um, I ended up buying the U.S. office from the partners and the last 21 years have been doing private detective work instead of being a lawyer, although I still am a lawyer, but that's how I got here. I just decided to take a sidestep and put the legal skills and investigative skills to work in a less intense environment and having a lot more fun ever since. How about you, Ben? How'd you, how'd you get to where you are right now? Um, definitely 
kind of fell into what I do. Um, I graduated college with a finance degree, uh, had a job lined up with Merrill Lynch to be uh, on an advisory team. Um, just kind of had an epiphany at the last moment, 11th hour, uh, and actually went to Robert Half to see if they would place me um, in a, a, you know, some sort of financial analyst type role. Um, quickly, the conversation shifted. Um, you know, they obviously liked me as an internal employee. So fast tracked 11 years, um, now vice president. I've managed all different types of teams at Robert Half, um, done a variety of different you know, roles, uh, whether that's recruiting focused, sales focused, and business development, management, training. Um, so I truly fell into what I, what I do. Um, you know, when I, when I felt, when I came out of college, so it's my only, uh, only, only position out of college 11 years in. Oh, that's awesome, man. How about, how about you? Cause you've been, can you move with integrity for a long time? How did you get the integrity? Well, so yeah, I, I fell into staffing as well. I, I Very quickly, I grew up in Baltimore and I went to college at Johns Hopkins, got out, um, kind of bounced around a couple of different jobs in Baltimore, some sales positions. I just couldn't find my niche. So I ended up moving. I went through something completely different. So I moved out to Harford County, Maryland, which is a few counties northeast of Baltimore and got a job with this company that manufactured car seats for Chrysler. I was the production manager and then became the QC manager. Um, and I started using a staffing service to help me supply people into my building. So I got to know the uh, owner of the company. It's a national staffing firm, but it was a franchise. So they, got, they were local owners. Anyway, fast forward, our company unfortunately lost our contract with Chrysler. So they were going to move me to Michigan. I said, I'm not moving to Michigan. So I, so I ended up leaving and I just got married. And my wife says, why don't you go back to that staffing company you know? Maybe they can find something for you. I went back and uh, the owner happened to be there. And he said, how would you like to work for me? I said, doing what? He said, interviewing people and putting them at the job. I said, sounds pretty easy to me. So started working for him. I got promoted. I uh, He bought the rights to all of Delaware. I became the branch manager up in Delaware. So my wife and I moved to Delaware. Um, worked for him for about another seven years. Ended up running his franchise for him. But then met this guy uh, who just started his brand new staffing service called Integrity in Delaware. And I was just blown away by this guy. Um, his vision about how to treat the temporary associates was kind of in line with what my vision was of that. So I ended up leaving and going with this little upstart. And uh, and our little miracle we call it happened is that this little tiny company called Amazon opened up one of their first distribution centers in Delaware, no one even knew who they were. We started working with them. Um, they were so impressed with our service that as they started growing around the country, they just brought us with them. So that's, what, that's how we kind of end up going from a little regional service to now one that has a national presence. Um, and I've had many different jobs with uh, Integrity. Right now, I'm basically uh, focusing on sales in the Mid-Atlantic region, doing some national sales, um, and having a blast. So. You know, it's funny. This is one of the first times where the people have been, every, every my guess has been with the company for, the, for over 10 years. So I, I went up to change my questions, and I was prepared. That I want to know, I know you've all had different positions with your company, but how do you keep it exciting? Like, it's it's the same, you're going to the same office, and that may sound weird because you're all done well, but there has to be something that, it's like anything, like if you go to the same bar for 10 or 12 years, after a while you go, ah, you know, you get a little, you get a little, I don't know if the word's complacent, but you get anything. So Ben, how do you keep it exciting, even though you've grown, and this is, and for you, this is your first job out of college, which is, is amazing, it's kudos to you, because my first job was selling fax machines, but I didn't sell copiers because I drove a Fiero, and the copier wouldn't fit in the Fiero. But Ben, how do you, how do you keep it exciting? Because you know, and you know, because you're on the fast track, if you're vice president now, how do you keep it fresh every day? Um, I think it has a lot to do. I mean, Ken, maybe you, you have the same experience. I mean, because we're industry agnostic and, you know, we work with companies of all different sizes, you know, every day is different. Um, and I know that sounds cheesy and probably like a canned answer, but it's true. You know, I, I never really know what I'm walking into. I have a set plan for what I want my day to look like, but you know, come 11 o'clock, um, my attention and my priorities could be totally shifted. Um, so every day is, has its new challenges. Um, you know, there's always, I think this is important to say too, there's always room to do more within our world. I mean, you know, we're mostly in, in a business development 
capacity. That's the, the I'd say about 80% of our jobs is, you know, selling the services that Robert Half provides. So there's always, you know, new ways of marketing, new ways of meeting people, networking. Um, so keeping it interesting that way, you know, that along with the, the different types of companies I get to place people at, um, you know, I could be filling a role at, you know, the hospital university of Pennsylvania one day, and then I'm filling a, a role for a 10 person manufacturing firm in South Jersey, you know, and, and that's, that's a lot of what keeps me driven. And then also the people under me, you know, um, I have a, a great team under me and developing them and training them, um, seeing their success really, uh, really keeps me going. How about you, Ken? What keeps, what keeps, I mean, not, yeah, what keeps you going, Ken? Yeah, so similar to Ben, um, but while, while I was at Integrity, uh, the first 10 years or so, I started moving more and more, well, to back up, when I first started working for Integrity, we were such a small team that everyone did everything. I did sales, I did operations, I filled job orders, everything. But as we started growing as an organization, we became more structured, people had different roles, and I was kind of moving into a path where I was becoming more of a corporate employee, imagining different branches around the country. And quite honestly, I was getting away from what I really love about our industry, and that's getting out there and helping companies develop staffing strategies and networking and, and just business development is what I love and what I'm, I've always been passionate about. So I, I made a decision, I talked to our owner, I really want to get back into sales. Uh, operations just doesn't excite me anymore. And about five years ago, they allowed me to do that. And that's what kind of rejuvenated myself because quite honestly, I was debating how, how long I was going to be in this industry, you know, but now the fact that like Ben said, every day is different. You know, I'm meeting manufacturing companies, I'm meeting banks, I'm meeting you know, so many different companies on a weekly basis and helping them solve their staffing issues. That what, that's what really gets me jazzed up every morning. So okay. I have no problem getting excited every day. Okay. How, about, how about you, Jeff? Well, our cases really uh, keep everything moving along and preventing things from getting stale. We, uh, you know, fraud happens 24 hours a day and every, every week we get another case in the door that's uh, a small mystery. And I, I was always a fan of Sherlock Holmes and uh, Alfred Hitchcock wrote a children's series or you know, young adult series called Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators. And it was you know, 200 pages of you know, solving a mystery. And so our cases are what keeps us uh, excited to come into work. People try to outsmart somebody else. They think they're the smartest people in the room and um, the investigation makes it fun. Um, meeting, you know, Certainly, I, I echo Ken and, and Ben's sentiment about you know going out, networking, doing the marketing, um, writing articles, uh, lecturing to the bar association on the topic of you know computer investigations and and how to run background checks and what to look for. You know that's that makes it fresh. You know, try to do that once a month or so. So there's you know, there's always something else to do that is different from what it was the week before. And realize, as I said, the cases are what makes it fun okay so so we're in a new year now it's 2024 we're actually got it. it's it's almost february are you guys goal setters and if you are like i mean i know Sneo, ben you said you make a list every day when you go into work and you know do you set for long long forecast long goals do you have goals set for yourself this year and if so what are they like ken have you set some goals that you want to attain this year um i have and and the first one i have to say would be health wise um we we Without getting into too many details, we had a, a personal matter with our family that I drew a lot of my attention the last couple of years. I'm helping my son out. And I got I had to get away from networking. I, and quite honestly, I got away from taking care of myself. Um, but that situation's resolved and things are good. So now I'm taking a lot more time trying to get myself in better health because I kind of let myself go. And so that's number one, because it because you know, if I'm not healthy, I don't have my energy, I'm just not performing to the best I can. You start losing confidence and it just it's a downward spiral so i'm really focusing on that um also getting back into networking um for many years i, I would go to two or three different networking events a, a week really had to get away from that because my nights were kind of taken up with family stuff um and and one th one of my goals this year is um i have a good friend of mine named keith baldwin i'm not sure if any gentlemen know him or not but uh i took keith to this event a couple years ago where this guest speaker was talking about this book she wrote where she would tr she tried something new like every week just to kind of you know, keep her life you know interesting, and Keith took it to an extreme. He started and this was 2020, right before the pandemic hit. He actually started a journal and he tried to do something new every single day, 
And he was telling me this story and he, I got the book and it's amazing. And he did it. He did something new and he got it through the pandemic too, which is a fascinating story. So one of my goals this year is to do something new. I'm not gonna do it every day, but something new every week. And I've already started it and just small things or big things, but I, I got a whole journal now that I'm starting and keeping track of that. So just something to kind of expand myself a little bit. It's something I want to do this year. How about you, Ben? Um, yeah, I mean, I sit down um, about a week before Christmas, um, look at all my goals from the previous year, look at, um, you know, where I was with them. You know, I'll be frank, I didn't meet all of my goals last year because um, some of them were lofty. Um, but I sat down at the end of the year, um, put some growth goals together for my business, for my people under me, um, you know, basically their quarterly goals and then an overall year over year percentage growth goal. Um, but you know, we have, we have stopping points along the way. We have, you know, weekly meetings and check-ins on our goals. You know, what, what are we doing get closer to the goal um you know what could be uh other avenues we could take you know to maybe think outside the box um it's a very collaborative environment that i work in so um goal setting is really important not just from an individual standpoint but from a team standpoint so you know holding each other accountable to our our team goals and our um you know even our daily activity right like what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis um, to help promote our business. You know, how many meetings are we setting? Are we moving back towards in-person meetings? I would agree with networking, right? Like we're back to a point where, you know, people are, are willing to meet with you again. You know, um, it doesn't all need to be virtual. doesn't all need to be, you know, in, impersonal. <laughs> um, you know, we can get back out there. We can go back to, you know, going on site. You know, in, in our industry, Ken would agree, you know, it's very important to have that relationship with a client, you know, and also understand the environment in which you're sending candidates into. So you can articulate, you know, what that's like, what the culture is like to the candidates before they ever step foot on site. Uh, it helps with placeability. It helps with the matching process. Um, so getting back out there is big for me this year. That's just an overarching goal. Networking is something that uh, is definitely you know, top of mind. Okay. How about, how about you, Jeff? So, um, my, our goal this year, or my goal this year is business continuity. Um, got to bring in some junior folks to carry the torch forward. I've got to train them. My partner uh, has to train, you know, his junior. So that's our goal for the year is to begin uh, the search for not our replacements, but our enhancements. And so that's where, uh, that's our primary goal for this year is to get the agency ready for the next 20 years, uh, get the right people on the bus and get them in the right seats and make sure that Maradell, you know, is, is more than just you know, the, the bodies that are in here now. Um, you know, we don't like the inventory walking out the door every night. Uh, we want to make sure that the, you know, the, the, the continuity of, of the agency is secure. So that's our goal for the year. And I agree with both uh, Ben and Ken. Networking uh, is also you know, very much a goal of ours and, and more so for me uh, in that I want to network and I want to pay it forward. I want to take all the Rolodex of people I've met in the 35 years doing you know, work in South Jersey and Philly, New York, and get people connected to those who can help grow their businesses, um, making those relationships, making those connections. Um, just putting people in touch. And that's you know, part of what I started this year already. And I'm gonna continue with that. And it doesn't matter who you are, I'm, I'm sure I know somebody who can help you. I met a guy who was making bread and he was gonna open up a, uh, in, in a, a, a co-location facility that makes you know other food stuff. And I said, I got a guy who's in that business already. Let me put you together. It's just crazy who you meet throughout uh, your, your years. And here's somebody I'm hoping I can make this connection for this uh, young guy and get them going. That's going to make, you know, that's part of our goal. That's my goal personally, you know, this year to try to pay it forward more so than I've done in the past. And I've done a lot, but this year, uh, you know, we've got, I have the capacity to get it done. Um, and, and that's, those are the two things that we've been focusing on or will be focusing. Now you mentioned networking. I want to say, you know, it's funny. I'm going to ask this question. We'll lead into, I'll talk about networking later, but I want to know, you know, we go to networking events and, and you, and we network socially and, and, you know, people have no problem not you guys, but a lot of people have no problem telling you how great they are. 
Okay, like you sit there and you're gonna, and someone will just say, "Oh, I'm great at this," you know, this, 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 this. Well, for you, what is a strong part of your personality that you think has helped you become successful? Because you know, none of you guys are full of shit. I, I know that you wouldn't be on the show if you're full of shit. And I see people who are full of shit all the time. But what's a strong part of your what's a person part of your personality that has made you successful, Jeff? Um. I'm a gregarious kind of guy who just likes to get people engaged and laughing. And, and I don't mind, you know, talking about myself a bit to, to, to ease into a conversation. I think that's, you know, in, in the networking sphere, um, I, I kind of break the ice without needing an icebreaker. And for example, last night I was at an event, came home with six or seven cards. It's just because people wanted to chat and like to talk about themselves and, most of the people we were talking to last night were not talking about their businesses. We ended up talking about golf and beers and other, you know, personal items that uh, we just had conversations with. And that's what, uh, in, in the networking sphere, I think is my strength is just getting a conversation going without having to talk about business. You know what I do in five seconds, you know, oh, PI, great. I'll call you if I want to investigate my girlfriend or boyfriend or husband. Put that aside. Let's talk about something that's more fun. How about you, Ken? What's, what's a strong point that makes you successful? Um, quite simply, I think it's just, you know, I, I'm a very caring person and I love helping people. And I think it's what's really helped me in this industry because, you know, it's one of the reasons I left my first company went with Integrity is because one of my owner's core values was he didn't want to build a staffing company that filled job wars. He wanted to build a staffing company that generated opportunities for people. And that's always been with me. So when I get to like a networking event, if I meet someone and we start talking a little bit, my first inclination the next morning is to see if I can connect that person with someone who can help him out. He may reciprocate, who knows? If he doesn't, no harm done. But that by doing that, it, I have received tenfold. I mean, you know, I'm a man of service. I'm, I'm a man of uh, deep faith too. So um, I love volunteering and all those things that don't seem like they would immediately help you. Believe in the long run, that's what makes you truly successful. When you're a giver and you're a volunteer, and you're a person of service, I found that's, that's the best way to be a successful person. And it's just so natural to me that it's just not something I strive for. It's just who I am. How about you, Ben? Yeah, I think being genuine, um, I think that's probably the, the answer that I can think of best. Um, kind of goes into to what both Jeff and Ken had said, though, um, you know, <laughs> all we do is deal with people, right? Like I, I deal with people all day long, right? The clients, candidates, I don't sell any products, no widgets, it's people. So um, how do you navigate those waters? Just be genuine, you know? Um, you know, I connect with my, I connect with my clients the same way I connect with my candidates, you know, break down any, you know, um, uh, basically try and find common ground with everybody, you know, be being genuine allows your, you know, your, your, whoever you're dealing with to kind of see, you know, your vulnerabilities, right. You know, being open and honest. Um, I think it goes a long way. Um, you know, it, it's, it's easy to be able to read a script or, or, you know, put a sales hat on, but uh, anybody I have met that has had a long successful sales career, um, they're genuine, you know, and, and you, you, you want to hear what they have to say. They don't sound salesy. There's nothing about them that sounds salesy. They, they, they sound genuine when you talk to them. So the year passed, 2023 is gone. You know, we all, we all sit there. You set your goals for 24, um, 23. What do you think your biggest accomplishment was? Uh, we'll start with you, Ben. It can be personal. It can be, it can be your job, but for you, what do you look back and go, man, 2020, three was great because this what, what is one thing that sticks out to you well that's a it's going to be a little bit of, of a skewed answer there my son was born last year so 2023 was was definitely all about him um biggest accomplishment of uh of the year by far um but you know taking it towards business um my third my my la latest hire um has really come along he met his goals in in the third and fourth quarter um he is developing really really well um he's a younger gentleman he's 24 years old been with the company for two years 
Um, and I am just very proud of him. Um, you know, he's, he's, I don't know, not your typical 24 year old, if you will. Um, very conversational, very genuine guy, you know, um, you don't feel like you're talking to a 24 year old when you talk to him. Um, and you know, he's, he's starting to see a lot of success. So that's awesome. And how about you, Ken? Um, I think for me, besides the fact that, like I said, a personal matter that was taken care of and, and really uh, was beneficial to the whole family, but on the professional side, um, so I've, like I said, I've had many different roles with integrity, but I've never really been in business development in Philadelphia. It's something I've never really done before. I've mainly been in South Jersey, other locations, even out in the Midwest. But they asked me last year to take on business development management in Philadelphia and had a really successful year doing it. And quite honestly, besides going to the Eagle games and Philly games and some tour stuff, I really didn't spend a lot of time in Philadelphia, but it was a great year. Like I said, we brought a lot of new clients and, and really successful. So um, that turned out to be a little plus for me. How about you, Jeff? Well, in our business, um, you know, the computer investigations that we do, we, you know, we have a, a niche in that market. Um, but a lot of lawyers uh, and corporations will call us, in-house counsel will call us to do some oddball things in the technology world. They want to, you know, can we can we solve this mystery of what happened and tracing something um, or it's, we had a data breach of some sort. So our goal last year um, was to, to find a couple of vendors, uh, other companies with like-minded people in them to help, you know, expand our, our capabilities. You know, so we were successful in getting two different vendors under our, our, our wings to be able to say, we can do that now. Uh, and now we have this great relationship with two companies that when a case comes in, we can now confidently say, we can get that done. And we have the horses to, uh, to, to bring that over the finish line. So that's, those were our goals last year. We, and we have two great partners now that round out our, our, our business. So that on the business side of things, that's what we needed. We, we kept saying no to certain things now we can say yes to it. You know, we don't make as much money because we have to, you know, obviously we're paying some uh, subcontractors, but it broadens our services. It gives us a greater platform to go out and, and talk to legal counsel and get more business in the door because there will be those other cases that we do work in on our own. And, uh, it, you know, we, we want the phone to ring. So that was our, that was our goal last year. Personally, work-life balance, um, given that we now can, do these extra things and I have other people to do them uh, from these other vendors who can help us out instead of me trying to figure out how to do some of the stuff I have some more time so it was just more time with the kids going down to visit the kids uh, where they live and just as I said golf before and spending some more time playing golf but knowing that it's not the rat race it's a it's a journey and you know retirement although it's a couple of years away I don't want to look at it as um you know, that's the goal. The goal right now is to enjoy ourselves and then with a, with a newborn, you know, absolutely spend as much time as you can. They grow up real fast. And that's, you know, that's the other side of our business lives, being able to say, oh, I wish I spent more time in the office. It's not something anybody wants to say, unless you don't have enough money to pay the rent. But that's <laughs> that goes without saying. Now, now, all of you guys, you know, I want to I'm wondering what your answer is to be and, and how it affects what you do. And then Ben and uh, Ken, you might be on the, on the same page, but what's, you know, what's your thought about AI? I keep saying things about AI and now coming from an entertainment background, you know, you're never going to replace, you know, a writer, a good script with AI, but you can also go on LinkedIn and see someone's posts that are all created by AI because it's the same bullshit run on sentence with a space in the space in the space. And I always laugh because it's like, if you're trying to convey a message, it should come from your heart, not from AI. I mean, LinkedIn just said to me the other day, we can 35% of your posts could be AI. I'm like, no, I don't want that. But Jeff, what's your view on AI? Because you're into fraud and you're onto that. Is that something that's gonna in, impact your industry? A tremendous amount of discussion about AI in the courts right now. Um, I, I'll say, on the worrisome side, on the bad side, as opposed to the positive side. I mean, there's so much positive, uh, so many positive uses for AI as far as you know, streamlining normal practices of medicine. You know, taking thousands of images of you know X-rays and being having a doctor be able to say we we matched you know 10,000 images to what we see in, in this film, and you actually have this versus that. I mean, that's going to be great stuff. On the worrisome side. 
AI in as far as deep fake videos, deep fake photos, audio recordings, it's going to cause tremendous upheaval as people try to use that technology for to get an advantage, which may be illegal under various state statutes, federal statutes. Uh, it may be defamatory, um, invasion of privacy. So there's a ton of this coming down the pike. And I was on a panel with some judges uh, two weeks ago, and they are beginning to see it more so at the federal level and the state level. But they're beginning to see the, the negative impacts of AI. And in your perspective, uh, Ben and Ken, it, it really, they were focusing most, mostly on the hiring process. You know, you've got algorithms when you have a employer putting out, you know, uh, applications for jobs and you fill out all your information and then it goes into the back room of AI and AI processes it all and filters it all and a somebody can program it to weed out people from this area or that background or you know they can pull in other data from various database sets that you can buy and feed it into your program and suddenly you're not hiring any women, any people of color, any you know people older than this or younger than that, um, glasses, no glasses, good looking, bad looking. And then the next thing comes is a discrimination case. And the courts are trying to figure out how do we deal with this? It was always a hard problem to see when human beings were making these decisions about whether we're going to hire this person versus that person. Was that discriminatory? Now you got a computer doing it. Given that there is a audit trail, it may be easier to figure out whether the system was already rigged so that no matter who applied, this group was not going to be considered because we filtered it to get them out. Now, is there a business reason? Is there a legitimate basis for saying somebody of this per nature can't lift 50 pounds? Okay, then there's a legitimate business reason for the job. It's going to become more and more concerning uh, to businesses as they start to adapt AI for things, not knowing what's behind in that box. And suddenly they're getting what they want, but they don't realize why they're getting what they want. And at the end of the day, somebody may challenge it. And then I'm going to end up in a courtroom going, here's the filter that said, no people from this zip code. And that's why you don't have these people working for you. And that may be a violation of the law, but that's how we see it. I don't mean to talk a lot, but that's highly, highly concerning to a lot of companies and certainly to the courts right now. Well, I'm good looking and I have glasses, so I don't worry about that. So we're safe. Got it. You'll always you, have ben? a job. <laughs> ben, what's what's your what's your take on AI? Um, well, I guess I could give two different takes on it. One, how I think it's beneficial to my job. Uh, I, I think it could streamline a lot of the resume summarization that we do. Um, you know, we, we typically will take a resume and summarize it for a client. Um, but even then, to be very honest, you know, we still need to kind of put our own little, you know, little twist on it, right? H humanize it a little bit more, give our, you know, give our own take on the ROIs of this person. Um, so, you know, it is helping. We are using, we use chat GPT. Um, so we do use it in some cases. That's really the only cases that we're actually hands-on using it right now. Um, the conversation, we just had a meeting about uh, AI um, because obviously it's existed in the staffing world for a while now. You guys all probably have heard ads for ZipRecruiter and so on and so forth. And we have our own AI internally with our system. Um, but what we're expecting is that there's going to be a need for more people like or for people like Ken and I um, to still be involved in the hiring process um, because of how human it is. Right. And it's a function that a lot of HR managers don't want to do. Right. The hiring process is typically the least favorite thing that they do in, uh, you know, in their in their day to day. Um, so, you know, the more you see instances like Jeff, we're talking about, Jeff, Jeff was talking about with, you know, oh, we're going to streamline our hiring process with AI, so on and so forth. You know, we think it's going to just create more opportunity for staffing firms, specialized staffing firms. Um, you know, not only do they have the industry knowledge, but, um, they have the recruiting knowledge and the ability to, you know, still use AI, but put the human touch on it. Okay. How about, how about you, Ken? 
Um, so I have very similar thoughts as, as both Ben and Jeff. Um, you know, as someone who's been in the staffing world for 30 years, I mean, I've always loved technology because I look at you know how we used to operate like in 1991 for, when I first got into it. I mean, we had like you know paper applications. We pulled them up in Rolodex, you know, Rolodex things and flip through to find people for jobs. And now, of course, everything's automated. So I've always loved technology, but I do fear sometimes of all the issues that that Jeff was bringing up, and and also just getting away from the personal touch. You know, I, I just hope we don't get too far where a lot of the personal touch starts leaving and, and then everything gets automated. So that's kind of my fear as well. Some of the other things that Jeff was bringing up from a legal standpoint. So you guys earlier, all of you mentioned networking. That's something you say you want to do more. And uh, what don't you like about networking? You know, we can all say we love this about networking. We love because you love to meet people. That's what we do. You know, it's it's a different it's a different world. You know, you're, to get clients, you're not knocking on the door back in the old days, you know, having to sneak into a office building in Philadelphia and get by the security guard. We don't have to do that crap anymore. We can actually just sit there and, uh, you know, go and network and meet people. But on the upside of networking, it is fun. But but what do you not like about networking? Like, Ken, what pisses you off or just you, you sit there and go, I, I don't know, this is uh, this is sort of a pain in my ass. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I get pissed off, but um, I, I guess it's more people who don't really understand or don't want to take the time to understand what networking is really all about. You know, it's not about going to an event, finding one person and just kind of like hanging around that person the whole night. You know, it's about meeting people and trying to connect with people who you can benefit and they can benefit you. And I think that, you know, many times I'll go to an event and uh, I'll hook up the one person who is maybe seen or not engaged with anyone. And then the whole night, they're just kind of like following me around, which is okay, but that's not really what I'm there for. And I feel rude if I don't keep talking to them. So um, I guess, like I said, just people who, don't really understand the benefit behind it, aren't really engaged, and are just there to collect some business cards and say they went to a networking event. That's really the thing that kind of frustrates me a little bit. How about you, Ben? Yeah, I mean, we've all been to the networking events where it's just a sea of salespeople, right? And, you know, they're all kind of targeting the same same one or two people that are there. I mean, I think I think being a good networker is recognizing that other business development professionals can be good people to meet as well, right? Like, you know, uh, like even Ken, like I I can't wait to talk to Ken after this meeting because I think him and I could create a partnership because I can't help clients with what he does and I think it's probably the same way for him. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that. But too many people in business development are closed minded and don't can't really see, you know, those opportunities. OK, how about you, Jeff? Yeah, I've been to events where the uh, the networking clicks that are there you know, don't let you into their circle. And I've left several uh, over the years where I've been there for maybe 20 minutes and realized these people have no interest in meeting anybody as, as Ken was saying, you know, just one person jumping in and just want to talk to one person. Well, I've been to places where it's, you know, clicks in the room and there was no point in staying. It was, it just, that's what, um, that's what bothered, bothered me about, you know, a couple of these networking events that I went to where they're just, as I said, gregarious guy, like, you know, stick my hand in there, say hi. And it was just the circle closed back up. And so there have been a couple of those events where that's, the wrong way to go about networking. That's a, that's a that's a party. That's a, you know that's a yeah. that's a watch party or whatever you want to go. It's not a networking event at that point. It just becomes something that uh, you know that those groups uh, have to learn that they can't just have these friends clicks and call them networking parties or networking events. Yeah, you just got to call them something else. Well, here's a question I always bring up. I'm gonna we're gonna talk about LinkedIn and uh, and lately. Okay, first of all, I'll start with by saying I'm. I'm not a very religious guy, okay? My wife's Catholic, she donates to the church. I grew up a Presbyterian in a Jewish neighborhood and had a, had a Muslim friend in high school. So I'm, I'm, I know all the different angles. And if you wanna talk about religion, I'm fine with it. I think if you're on Facebook, it's fine. But I've seen lately some people on LinkedIn are sitting there, and if one of you disagrees with me, I want to hear why, because I'm very interested on your insight. But I see people thanking God and the Lord for getting this business deal and this, and like, oh, I want to, I had such a great networking, I want to thank the Lord. And I'm, I, I don't think LinkedIn's the place for that. Maybe I'm a get off my lawn type of guy. But do you think there's a place 
for religion. Unless, of course, if you're a pastor or a church, more that's your business. Put it out there. But I'm one of those people I think LinkedIn's more for business. What Ben, what do you think about sharing religion on LinkedIn? And there's no right or wrong answer. And I hope one of you actually <laughs> want to do it so I can hear your insight and I can understand it more. But Ben, what's what's your view on it? Uh, well, I can give you a couple takes on it. So one, I have to remember that people aren't changing roles all the time. They aren't going on LinkedIn all the time, right? So it's not like Facebook and Instagram. People don't scour LinkedIn. A lot of people don't scour LinkedIn unless they're actually looking for a job. They don't look at it as a social media platform, you know, to, you know, do what we do, right? I, I scour LinkedIn. Um, Ken probably scours LinkedIn as well. We look for lead opportunities. We look for job openings, you know, all those things. So when you see someone post something like that on LinkedIn, you know, I, I think it has a lot to do with that, right? They're not on it very much. They need to, they want to put it out there. They're announcing their new position or whatever it is. Um, but you know, the second take on this kind of goes to what I was saying before about being genuine. You know, people want to show that they are spiritual, religious, whatever it may be. Um, you know, there's a lot of different types of groups on LinkedIn as well. And, you know, religious groups are one of them. So, um, you know, I think it's a way of just kind of showing your, your you know, who you are and, and what you believe in. And, um, you know, that's I think that's just part of it. But. Okay, that's good. At least I have I have a different view on it. How about you, Jeff? Um, first of all, I like it for investigative purposes. You can say whatever you like on social media, and I'm going to use that in your background check. And and if you're thanking the Lord, that's great. But um, it would give me a, a leads into where else to look for information about you, depending on how heavy uh, it is that you're putting religion out there. If it's just simply you know, I want to thank the Lord for you know letting me be uh, part of the, you know, this team and we, and we won, it was great. Um, you know, that's a passing reference and, and I think that's fine, but if it's becoming a religious um, uh, manifesto, uh, political manifesto, quasi, you know, combination, uh, I don't think that LinkedIn is the right place for that. Um, but certainly in a, in a passing you know, form, that's, that's okay. Uh, but that's, that's my take on it. But LinkedIn really is, should be focused on the, the business uh, community and, and not what you ate for breakfast or, uh, you know, I'm so proud of my kid for getting this participation trophy in his, you know, whatever, unless it's a mock trial, you know, we sec come in second place in mock trial. Absolutely put it up there. It's business oriented. Okay. How about you? How about you, Ken? So I, I, I tend to uh, agree with Ben and Jeff. I think that um, I love LinkedIn. I use it all the time um, for many different reasons. Um, and, but like I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I, I am a man of faith, but I, I don't post anything like that on LinkedIn. I just think it's more of a business thing. Um, to me, if I want to post something about my church or something, I'll put it on Facebook. I just don't think LinkedIn is the proper place to put it. That's just me. You know, do I, do I, you know, you know, all I do is I just, if I see something linked out, like I just scroll, you know, it's, it's that simple, you know, so, um, people can, I think can do what they want to do. I prefer to just keep LinkedIn business centered and anything personal more on Facebook and Instagram. So, okay. Now here's something I, this is something I started a, a few months ago and I always like it because you guys, I think I'm going to have good answers on this. If you read business books or a personal book, what's a book that has made influenced you or made an impact on you it could be years ago it could be maybe last week it could be business i like the people stay with business but i don't read business books so i'm not attuned to it but jeff is there a, is there a book that has made a difference or just made an impact and helped you in the business you do uh yes the book called uh, good to great by tom collins uh it was it's written a long time ago in 15 years ago, probably, maybe 20. Uh, but it was a book that followed uh, why certain businesses go from good to great and why others fail. And it talked, in, in essence, and I mentioned it earlier, uh, in essence, it's talking about getting the right people on your bus and getting them in the right seats. And it shows how corporations, uh, big corporations, um, manage to figure that out. And those that don't figure it out 
didn't succeed ultimately. So that's the key book that I saw in growing a business, building a business, Tom Collins, good to great. Other than that, um, not too many other business books that I, uh, that I read. See, I'm such, a, of, I'm such a derelict. I hear Tom Collins, I think, the drink with gin and a sour mix. That's just me. Trust me. That's the first thing I thought when my friend said, you got to read this book by Tom Collins. I was like, hey, <laughs> sounds good to me. It's good happy hour reading. Uh, Ken, any, any, what a book. Give me a book. So I admittedly do not read many business books at all. Um, if I read, it's, it's normally a fiction. I like historical fiction, things like that. But I will say, and I hate to repeat an answer, but I did read from Good to Great. Um, same book Jeff was referencing, and it's probably one of the few business books I did read that I really enjoyed and learned a lot from. So I'm more of a, I, I read business articles, watch bi uh, business uh, videos, things like that. Don't really read a lot of books. I, I just think sometimes books can become obsolete so quickly, the way the business world changes. That, Like I said, I'm more of a video article reader, that sort of thing. But I did like Good to Great. That is a great book. How about you, Ben? Because you're a younger guy. You're the young guy of the group. So you 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 know you probably have different influences. And you know, you're a professional. Is there an, do you read business books? And if so, has, has one made an impact on you? Yeah, I mean, I have, and I I've read a lot actually. Um, and truthfully, a lot of them can become very dry. Um, but last year I read um Matthew McConaughey's book. Um, and I'll be honest with you that a lot of what he talks about in that book resonated with me. Um, the way he approached his acting career, his life, um, you know, his family, um, that was very, uh, impact. I, I would say it was very, um, insightful. Um, I, I would agree too, Ken, a lot of those business books, how quickly everything's changing in the world, uh, you know, with AI, <laughs> uh, and everything else, um, you know, a lot of them can be a little stale, um, so I would recommend it, uh, if you haven't read it, uh, I think it came out about two or three years ago. Uh, it's called green lights, Matthew McConaughey. It's amazing. You know, I, I know a lot of actors and, and they go through so, so, so much rejection, you know, even the ones that are successful, you know, I just had a guy on the Cooper talk, my other podcast, who was Mikey Palmisi on the Sopranos and he's still, you know, he got recognized, but then after that. You know things don't happen and i did a guy malcolm malcolm goodwin who was in the first season of reacher he played the stiff the, the african-american detective and he was saying you know that show they shot it before you know the pandemic and usually if you have a show and it goes on your career takes off but things happen and they go through so much rejection so matthew that's a great book about mcconaughey because those guys go through rejection you know they, they go through more rejection than salespeople. i know guys who had big series and they're still auditioning so it's just crazy so i'm gonna look into that book thank you ben now here's the ironic, final ironically the guy from uh mikey palmisi is in reacher he's in the new season yeah he is in the second i asked him about when he got yeah. sma smashed against the wall i just interviewed him the other day <laughs> um so this is my final question and uh i always look forward to the answer to this someone comes up to you as my, my mom would say bright-eyed and bushy-tailed someone comes up to you they're getting they can be out of trade school high school college whatever they're starting this path into the business world. You know, they want to make a difference. They, they want advice. Jeff, what's advice? What, what would sound advice that you could give someone who comes to you sort of as you as being a mentor and says, what, what do I got to do, Jeff? What, what's, what's out there for me? I'll start with two, th two things. First, what are you passionate about? Got to have passion. Got to like what you do. Uh, if you're in it for some other reason, then you're going to stumble. But whatever it is you choose to do, each job, each task, it's a, it's a learning curve. Learn from whatever, take all you can from it, whether it's in my son's case, you know, he started out as a server. Learn everything you can about serving, how to deal with people. Use that as a stepping stone. Take that to the next position you go to and learn from them. What's good about how, these, how that operation works? What's bad about it? How did you get treated? Don't treat your employees the same way. Make sure you do better. You, to, you, you Every step of the way, just learn from it. At some point, you're going to be in a position to make a decision for yourself, either start your own business or change careers or go work for another company. But take all that learning experience and, and, and synthesize it and make yourself a better um addition to that team by learning from these things. Don't just treat it as a job. If things go bad, 
you hate the job. I can't stand my boss. Why? Why, why, why? And learn from that. You know, ultimately, you'll, you'll, you'll move on, but learn from these things. They're all learning experiences. There is no bad job, just a learning experience. That's my advice to somebody getting out there because jobs are tough to come by, um, but that's how I you know, would, would advise somebody. Be passionate about what you do and whatever it is you're doing, learn from it and then take it to the next level so you can be a better person in 10, 15 years from now and have people want to work for you because you're going to take the best of what you learned and avoid the worst. How about you, Ben? Uh, I'd say two things. There's a big difference between a job and a career. Um, kind of goes into what you were saying, Jeff, what you're passionate about. Um, plus a career is something that you'll, you know, sink your teeth into, be excited about every day, um, you know, and, and you won't call it a job. Um, and the other thing is, um, your time is, is valuable as, as the person you're dealing with until you make it not. So, you know, as a 22 year old kid selling to CFOs and HR directors, I had to learn quickly and adapt quickly, um, you know, to that, to that mantra, if you will. Um, so, um, I'd say those are my two main ones. Okay. How about you, Ken? And so I'll, I'll tell a real quick story. Um, uh, three or four years ago, I had a sales rep working for me who I could tell she just wasn't there. You know, just didn't seem passionate what she was doing. Um, so we, we went to lunch with this gentleman who's a very well-known business leader in, in the South Jersey area. I won't mention his name. But anyway, we're having lunch. And during the whole lunch, all he kept talking about was you need to understand your why. You need to, you need to constantly be asking yourself, what's my why? And it was a really powerful conversation. I mean, we didn't go there intending to go through all this, but that's what you start talking about. So two days later, she comes to me and she resigns, okay? And the, you know, at first I was upset, but she got into a career that now she loves. And we're still very good friends and she contacts me all the time. And she said, Ken, I learned, I gotta constantly be asking myself, what's my why? So I think that's something that's really important. When you're going through your career, you gotta keep asking yourself, what's my why? And am I passionate about what I'm doing in, in, this, in this current career? Or do I need to make changes? All right. This has been great, guys. Uh, now, Jeff, how can people get in touch with you? And then how can people find out more about the JBN? Uh, you can get in touch with me by going to maragel.com, M-A-R-A-G-E-L-L.com. Um, probably the easiest way of, of, of finding us. We actually created the, created the word. So if you see the word Maragel out there, it's going to be us. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as Jewish Business Network, uh, you can go to jewishsouthjersey.org, jewishsouthjersey.org. And there's a link in that homepage uh, for the JBN. And we meet the first and third Wednesdays of the month at the Jewish Community Center in Cherry Hill at 7.45 in the morning. Welcome. Guests are welcome. Job seekers are welcome. Uh, it's a great group. Very, uh, very warm and, and helpful. How about you, Ben? How can people get in touch with you? Um. I, LinkedIn is a great way to find me. All my contact information is on there. Uh, my email is easily easy. It's just benjamin.york at roberthalf.com. Um, or if you really want to locate me down, once the weather breaks, I should be uh, over at Woodcrest uh, playing golf most days, as long as the weather's nice. All right. How about you, Ken? Um, LinkedIn as well. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. But also, uh, my email address is very simple. It's ken at integritystaffing.com. So you can always tell people who have been with our company more than 20 years because it's their first name. So mine's ken at integritystaffing.com. Okay, so people reach out to them. Uh, you can contact me at thecooptank at yahoo.com. If you want to be an advertiser on the show, please hit me up. You know, the people who are on the show are business leaders. The people who watch the show are business leaders. What a better way to get your name out, if you're, especially if you have a small business, you want to get people to know you. Also, uh, February 7th at Split Bar and Grill in Laurel Lanes. It will be Cocktails with Cooper. Starts at 4.30. It's right there in Maple Shade. We get about 40, 45 people. No charge. Show up. It's some great networking. I even get people I don't know. Uh, February 24th, Pizzeria Uno in Maple Shade. I'll be doing stand-up comedy. I only perform once every three or four months. That would be uh, Pizzeria Uno. You can email me for more info. And it's, uh, yeah. And reach out to me. Listen to past shows on YouTube. 
search the coop tank and don't forget to check out sweet recording s-u-i-t-e recording.com reach out to joe ganjami the reason why he produces the show is because he's a good guy and he knows what he's doing so thank you for watching and i will all talk to you next week